This is a paper actually I have written upon request of Professor Lancaster and he's on the maritime building and he asked me uh, because he, he wanted to know about the monastic order of nuns, how it's transmitted in detail, of course, roughly everybody knows. I think in this room, a lot of people know the stories, how the Picuni order gradually transmitted from Sri Lanka to China. Uh, but Professor Lancaster wanted to know some details. Therefore, I sent him uh, uh, these materials in Chinese. And after he received this uh, material, he said, why don't you write a paper on this? You know, I said, okay, I will write a short paper. Then that's how this paper came into being. Uh, so I think, uh, although I think a lot of a few specialists know this uh, story quite well, and majority of this might be uh, not sure about the story. In fact, this story is uh, uh, quite important in a way because related to the transmission of the big tuning order, particularly the ordination ceremony. So it's a very important way for today how to restore the picture order in Taiwan countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Myanmar. And uh, I just start with the story. The story says that uh, a group of nuns uh, came to uh, China and they wanted to get uh, ordination. Of course, uh, a lot of women became nuns before this story took place in the early 5th century. Uh, but many of these nuns uh, became nuns, they just ordained by monks only, monks only. But according to the Buddhist tradition, for a woman to become a nun properly, it's called, you must have a dual ordination, or sometimes translated as two steps ordination. First, you have to get ordained from a group of nuns, and then later on, you need to get ordained by a group of monks. So this is called dual ordination. But earlier, before the Sri Lanka group of nuns came to Sri Lanka, uh, came to China, most of the Chinese women who became nuns, they got ordained only from the monks. For example, Jin Jie here is one of the uh, well-known uh, women. Uh, therefore, this became a quite an important issue. In fact, later on, a lot of nuns came to know about these things. Uh, therefore, they wished to be ordained properly. Uh, this is how the story uh, starts. Uh, so I just, before we um, move on to the story properly, I just give you some sources how this uh, uh, story is recorded. First, a uh, very important book is on the biographies of the nuns it's written by Bao Chang in his later years. So this is the most important book because it's recorded um, 65 nuns uh, life stories and also mentioned around 30 nuns so altogether might be around 95 nuns. So these are very important valuable information for us to study the history of the nuns. And there was also other, of course, uh, maybe a lot of people know this, also biography of the monks. Uh, why I mentioned the biography of monks? Because there's two Indian monks involved with the ordination ceremony. One is Gunavandra, uh, Gunavarma, another one is uh, Sendavarma. These two involved with this Bhikshuni ordination ceremony. Therefore, we need to get these uh, uh, important uh, stories from this. Then the third one is uh, Dao Xuanzi. It's a digest about Vinaya, uh, Buddhist Vinaya, particularly Dharma Gupta Vinaya. Uh, and in this, of course, uh, Dao Xue gave a very brief discussion on how the Bhikkhuni order transmitted to China. Of course, uh, this uh, because uh, it's too brief. And then later on, I found there's another person called Da Jue, and he's a little bit later than. Um, Dao Xue, it's all around 6th, 7th, or 8th century. Uh, these are important people. And Da Jue actually gave, provided a lot of information because Dao Xue gave, uh, because his uh, narrative is very short in a jest. And Da Jue gave a lot of information and he take another book from this, it's a biography of the Sarwa Shiva Vinaya teachers. 
So from this, of course, the book lost, but we get information from other books, for example, Daju's book. Uh, actually, he takes a lot of information and supplies, and he wrote a much better account of the Bikchuni order. Uh, there is also others, uh, of course, uh, later in the uh, Song Dynasty in the 11th, 12th centuries, there are so many commentaries on Dao Xue's work, and of course, I found that most of the information they just copied from either Da Jue or some others. Therefore, I did not go into detail about this. Then we come to the uh, story, how this story uh, took place. And according to this uh, uh, biography of the Big Chinese, there is a merchant called Nandi, and he came to China in 429 and brought with him eight nuns. Eight nuns. And these eight nuns came to, uh, at that time, it's the capital city, today's called Nanjing. And they came, and then they have a discussion with the local nuns, asking, how did you get ordained, blah, blah. Then after they thought, actually, these nuns just got ordination from monks only. And then these nuns, this group of nuns came from Sri Lanka, told them, actually, you have no proper being ordained. And then some of the nuns got worried, and then they went to some monks, like uh, Gunavanma, and also asked Gunavanma, how about this ordination? And then Gunavanma says, of course, uh, it's better you get ordination from uh, two proper people, from nuns and also from the monks. But no problem, don't worry about this. Then Gunavanma told them, because the first big chuni, as already mentioned by uh, Sui Hong and others, only get ordination from monks. <laughs> so don't worry about this. <laughs> However, the yeah. picture is still worried and we want to get proper ordination. However, therefore, then at this time, of course, it's Gunavanna. Gunavanna saying that, told to this uh, uh, merchant, why don't you go back to Sri Lanka and bring another group of uh, nuns? So because of this, tiny nuns wanted to get a proper ordination. So this is a Buddhist uh, a merchant, so he agreed. So we, he went back to the in the Chinese record, all we record as a lying country. Sri Lanka is known for his uh, lying. So this uh, uh, merchant went back to Sri Lanka and he came back after four years and brought another group of uh, Sri Nans. Sri Nans. So when this group of Sri Nans arrived and headed with a person called Devasara, Devasara. And when they came back to China, it's already uh, three or four years passed. And the group of nuns arrived in China earlier, they already learned Chinese. Then when Dai Sala came, so they can start immediately with the ordination ceremony. Uh, therefore, Dai Sala and together with another Buddhist monk, said that, so they hold this ordination ceremony properly. So there was a large number of women get properly ordained. According to the record of us saying that more than 300 women got ordained properly. And some of the monks also following, uh, because of the Indian monks came, they want to order it again. So these monks got ordained again. So this is a very important story. The story, of course, uh, we will analyze a little bit. There are a few things I want to discuss in this um, uh, in these stories, uh, in these stories. And first, uh, it's a confirmation about the proper ordination established in China. It's transmitted from a Taiwan country, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka. So the, the record is quite clear. Uh, most of scholars uh, believe this record as true. And this record shows that there is a direct link from Sri Lanka to China. China. And this group, uh, Chinese uh, Big Chuni lineage, continues from that day to today without a, a broken. Therefore, this is one of the very important things uh, I need to mention. Uh, therefore, today I think it's significant because uh, a lot of uh, not only um, you know Buddhist monks are interested in the restoration of the nuns' order back to Taiwan countries, but also even scholars are quite interested in this. Uh, so this is a, a very important information. However, of course, uh, in Taiwan countries, most of the women face some kind of uh, pressure 
from the elderly monks, more conservative, I would like to say, monks. They are a little bit resistant about the reintroduction of order. However, of course, uh, the majority of the Buddhist monks are quite open and also would like to uh, accept this. I know one of the great Buddhist monk, and his name is uh, Anurut, and he went back to Sri Lanka, and he started to give uh, ordinations and also teachings to the nuns. It's a good sign, at least. <laughs> And another point I want to say is uh, um, about these uh, people who involved. The first one is called Gunawan Man, and he, of course, came to China also around the Sea Route, around the Sea Route, from probably India and he embarked onto a ship and came to China and he landed in Guangzhou, and from Guangzhou later on he traveled to northern part of China. Uh, however, just before Devasala came, he died, unfortunately. <laughs> Therefore, he could not participate in the uh, ordination ceremony. Then, after he died, luckily, another Buddhist <coughs> monk, um, uh, he traveled from uh, northwestern part of China and probably from Kashmir come to China, and he uh, also a Vinaya master, and he, uh, he came and uh, he came right after Guna Man uh, died. Therefore, in fact, he uh, became the, the master and he all actually presided over as a chairperson and hold the, all the, uh, the, the ordination ceremonies. Uh, ceremony. So these two uh, monks' biographies all found in the uh, biography of the Buddhist monks. Uh, monks. Uh, Senta Varma, his name is. So these two, of course, the most important the first one, first one because he came to China through the maritime route, the maritime route. So another point I want to uh, discuss is that, and in this uh, uh, ordination and all the, the, the events taking place is that it shows the maritime route plays a very important role in the transmission of Buddhism from India or Sri Lanka to China. Uh, China. We know that uh, even before this event took place, Faxian had already mentioned Faxian several times in this uh, uh, meeting already. Uh, Faxian in fact went to India through the overland route and then he came back to China through the maritime route. Maritime rule. So he came to back to China in the early fifth century. Early fifth century. So this was that the maritime road opened quite early, and also the traffic is quite frequent. I would say. That's why a lot of people come to China through this uh, uh, maritime road. The another one, of course, not not involved with this is uh, uh, Gunabandra. Gunabandra is a Chan master. And he came to China through the maritime road, and he first he arrived China in Guangzhou through Hong Kong. Today's Hong Kong through Hong Kong, and he arrived in Guangzhou. And later, of course, uh, he was invited back to the north part and presided, uh, resided in the capital city at that time. Today is called uh, Nanjing, and he started his uh, teaching and translation. Uh, then later on, of course. Uh, Another person and more famous person is Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma also arrived in China through the maritime route. And first he arrived also in Guangzhou. From Guangzhou he traveled to northern part of China. So these are some important people. And uh, this just shows that this route is very important. And this route, and, uh, not only the Chinese monks, of course, uh, come from China to, to India, and one of these is 